All right, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes, everybody. I wanna let people um, get into the room. It takes just a little bit of time um, to do that. So sit tight and we will get started momentarily. I can see people are still coming in the room, so we're just gonna wait a few more seconds or so before we get started, and I officially welcome you. I just wanna give everybody a little bit more time to settle in, because I can see the numbers keep growing. So just a few more seconds and we will get started, I promise. <clears throat> All right, welcome and thank you for tuning in today to Webinars for Busy Lawyers. I'm Susan Letterman White, the Senior Practice Advisor at Mass Lomap. These webinars that we bring you at least once a month are designed to provide you with practical information in just 20 to 30 minutes. And by practical, what we mean is that you can implement what you learn here in your practice immediately. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Tracy Myers. Tracy joined LCL and LOMAP in August of 2020, following her work for the State of Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, where she spent over 15 years working as a clinical neuropsychologist, and most recently as the Director of Behavioral Intervention Services for Inpatient Services. <clears throat> Tracy has a strong commitment to integrative medicine for mental health and wellness and leads mindfulness and yoga programs for groups, individuals, and professionals in the workplace. Tracy is a licensed clinical psychologist in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. In addition, she is an advanced yoga teacher, certified CIAYT yoga therapist, MBSR, breath, body, mind, and eye rest teacher. Tracy has authored several publications, including articles and book chapters around integrative medicine, positive behavioral support treatment for different mental health conditions, and developing collaborative relationships in healthcare set settings. Before I turn it over to Tracy, which I will do so shortly, I wanna let you know that we will have time at the end to take all of your questions. So what I'm gonna suggest that you do is as soon as they arise, just write them into the chat box. And I promise you, at the end of Tracy's presentation, I will relay those to her at the end. Um, I also wanna tell you that if you enjoy this, I'm gonna be able to tell you about two more opportunities where you're gonna to get to hear more from Tracy. So stay tuned for that. So Tracy, take it away. Thank you, Susan. So I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm new to LCL and really excited to be able to share um, some of the integrative modalities that Susan mentioned, um, including mindfulness and um, some other techniques that might assist us during these difficult times. So I'm gonna start by sharing a PowerPoint with you all. So, I want to just take a moment, if we can, just to pause. So wherever you are, I always want to really honor what it takes to get to even like a webinar during a busy day. We might be eating, we might be rushing around, or maybe we're sitting in a place where, where it's quiet. But let's all just spend just about 60 seconds to pause, feeling your feet on the floor, just allowing yourself to really feel present. You might take one or two full breaths, breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. Just actually sense your breath. And maybe scanning the body, just noticing how your body's feeling right now. 
Noticing if you're carrying any tension or stress in your body. You're just rolling the shoulders back and down. Maybe moving a little bit in your chair to get more comfortable. So just feeling your body in this moment. So I like to arrive that way whenever I'm trying to start something new, whether transitioning or beginning a session with a client, just to take a, a moment to arrive because we're often so lost in our thoughts and rushing from place to place or even Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting. So today I'm gonna to talk a bit about the pandemic on, and the impact on mental health and the legal profession, then spend some time talking about the thinking and the worried mind because so much of what is happening for us is, is happening in the mind. Um, so we'll explore a little bit about some strategies to work with the worried mind, introduction to a little bit of mindfulness meditation um, to see how that might fit in with working with the worried mind, and then hopefully finding a little bit more ease and satisfaction in daily living. So just very briefly, we know that mental health for lawyers and legal professionals before the pandemic, there were um, a lot of concerns. The Hazleton study, which probably many of you are familiar with um, in 2016 showed significantly higher rates of alcohol use um, with attorneys, um, depression, anxiety, and stress were all high um, respectively for, for attorneys, somewhere in the 20 to 30% rate. A recent study in February, again, pre-COVID, showed that lawyers had a lot of anxiety. 64% of respondents, these were law firm um, respondents, indicated that they had anxiety, and about 80% indicated they knew someone that had anxiety, a colleague. And almost 75%, three quarters of the respondents said that work conditions were contributing to their stress. And we start to, to distill down, well, what's causing the stress or what's happening as a result of the stress? Feeling like you're always on call, not being able to disconnect, billable, the, the billable um, pressure, lack of sleep and client demands. And you know, the, the last statistic in terms of overall quality of life, two thirds of the respondents feel like, felt like their personal relationships were suffering as a result of work. So this is all pre-pandemic, right? Then we go into what's happening in the time of COVID during the pandemic. And we realize again that, that um, some of these same stressors have been exacerbated by, by um, the pandemic and the uncertainty. In the US alone, so this is all people surveyed in the US, about 53 or over half of the US right now has significant clinical anxiety and or depression. And that's way up from March. So they've, they've been tracking our mental health as a country. And we know that the mental health burden is continuing as we get into the fall and winter months um, you know, before a vaccine. So we wanna really be proactive in terms of how to meet our mental health needs. There's not a lot of data yet looking at attorneys and law practices. Um, the only one I could find was in Australia, but not surprisingly about 75% of the respondents said that they were having trouble focusing on their work, um, shifting to remote work like we've all been doing. And again, issues around sleep and uncertainty and anxiety. So we're worried a lot. We're spending a lot of time in our heads. So Mark Twain has this quote, which I relate to a lot. There's been much tragedy in my life. He is, was quoted as saying, at least half of it actually happened. So we spend a lot of time worrying um, about things that may happen, haven't happened, and get stuck in our head. So here's the startling statistic. We have about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Yes, they were able to analyze this, this 2005 study. But here's the part, so we, we're in our thoughts all the time, but here's the, the, the thought that's pretty startling. As we're thinking over and over again, 80% of our thoughts are negative. We're actually wired from an evolutionary standpoint to be searching for dangerous um, information. That's how we survive. We scan, we're vigilant to make sure that there's not danger. But over time, as we're in modern society, that evolutionary um, development has also created a lot of anxiety. So if 80% of our thoughts are negative, you can imagine each time we have a negative thought that can cause a jolt in the nervous system. And here's the kicker, 95% of our thoughts are the same. So we worry about the same things over and over again. 
I sometimes call it like the top 10 list, right? The top 10 tunes that I play over and over again, worrying about health, worrying about my kids, worrying about financial issues, worrying about the job. You know, even if they're not the exact same thought, they're themes that are very similar. Another study in 2005 indicated that 85% of what we worry about actually never happens. It goes back to that Mark Twain quote. But even if it doesn't happen, we're stuck in the worried mind. So what happens when we're worrying all the time? We have something, all of us have something called the window of tolerance where we feel, you know, kind of optimally healthy. We can reason, we're in charge of our emotions, we're able to mentally engage. Um, so we have this window of tolerance. And if we have chronic anxiety and worry, that can either kick us into hyper arousal where we're overactive, we're stressed, we're really anxious, our thinking deteriorates a little bit. Picture like that feeling of panic that can ensue. Or we can start to shut down. We can get depressed, kind of lethargic, unmotivated. And sometimes we fluctuate between all of the, the, these two areas. We can stay up for a while and then we might crash. So our window of tolerance can get exceeded especially during stressful times like the pandemic. Never mind, in addition to law work is really stressful. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more about kind of this chronic stress we're in. So trauma can affect our window of tolerance. If we have a lot of trauma and it might be secondary or vicarious traumatization, it might be primary trauma if we ourselves have had something traumatic happen and this pandemic is ongoing repeated trauma, Never mind the state of the world, when we start to think about what's happening in our country with racial injustice, the political climate, that's a lot of trauma for our system. And when we have a lot of trauma, our window of tolerance can shrink. So we might have a normally healthy window of tolerance, but as each traumatic event happens, we can, we can get smaller and smaller so that it takes little things to set us off. So we might get really irritated at a relatively small event, um, or we might get really overwhelmed and depressed with something that happened, even if it wasn't such a big deal because it's a cumulative effect. So how do we work with all of this? The second part of this talk is a lot less gloom and doom and a lot more positive. We're gonna talk about some strategies, but I wanted to lay the, the groundwork for this impact of our worried mind and what it does to the nervous system. A little hint on this slide, we are, I'm, I'm already suggesting this idea that when you work with a practitioner or you work with some tools, you can expand your window of tolerance again even if it's narrowed, which it can with trauma, we can work with our own ability to increase it over time. All right, so I wanna do a little bit more thinking um, around our automatic negative thoughts. So 80% of our thoughts tend to be negative. And I like this idea of automatic negative thoughts or ants. Makes it a little fun. Daniel Amen, who's a neuropsychiatrist, he has a wonderful book called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. And he personifies, he, he allows us to kind of look at our thoughts in a almost a categorical way, rather than getting stuck with just believing our thoughts. So he calls them black ants and red ants, which I really like. And these are different cognitive um, distortions or like thought patterns that are destructive. The red ants are the ones that can be really significantly um, impactful and can cause more stress reaction. So all or nothing thinking, kind of black or white. It has to be this or that. That can be an automatic negative thought. Always, you know, I always mess up. You know, when we start to use those always words, we, get, we can get really negative. Focusing on the negative, you know. So if you got, um, if you had a day where there was maybe one thing that went wrong, you tend to focus on that one thing. Thinking with your feelings, I think it's going to be a bad day, <laughs> right? We do that. We wake up sometimes, sort of that idea of we can, we're, we're like already prognosticating something negative. Guilt beating, making ourselves feel bad about something. Labeling, I'm a loser. I don't work hard enough. I'm a fraud, right? I'm an imposter. And then the last three, which can cause significant stress responses in the body. Number one, fortune telling. Imagine we can predict the future, like, oh, it's gonna be a terrible winter. COVID's here, everything's gonna go wrong, right? That sense of doom and, and that we can portend, which sometimes actually can happen because we're, we're thinking so negatively. Mind reading, which is that we assume we know what someone else is thinking. 
Um, so if we get an email from someone where we, we assume, well, they must not like me. Um, I'm on shaky ground with my boss because they want to have a meeting tomorrow. So that assuming we, we know how someone else thinks and feels. And finally, blame. Either blaming ourselves for what's happening or blaming someone else. So all of those negative thoughts are happening all the time, sometimes not even in our conscious awareness. So part of recognizing automatic negative thoughts, these ants, is we can recognize, hey, wait, this is happening, this pattern is happening, and we don't have to continue that cycle. We can learn some strategies to break the cycle. So how can we break our cycle with our, our ants, our automatic negative thoughts? So number one is just to identify them. Instead of believing them, which is what usually happens with automatic negative thoughts, we just believe, oh yeah, I'm thinking this, so it must be true. Instead, we can actually begin to first notice the automatic thought, and then we can ask ourselves a series of questions. These are called inquiry questions. Is the thought helpful? Is there another way to look at it? What evidence is there really for this? How would someone else look at the same thought or same situation? What advice would I give someone else? I love that one because often the advice we would give to a colleague, a friend, someone we care about is so much different than the advice we tell ourselves. We tend to be so harsh with ourselves and the advice often is so much more balanced when we think about how we would tell somebody else. Is this a fact or is it actually just a, an opinion? So this questioning, this inquiry process of meeting our automatic negative thoughts, making them conscious and engaging with them rather than just being, you know, kind of driven by them so that they're happening over and over again, creating that stress response. Okay. So number one technique that I like to do when my ants are crawling, right? When they're really running rampant in my, in my body and I'm feeling really anxious is the stop sign. It's the simplest technique and it actually really works. Now, so first of all, we wanna to come to a pause. When we're stuck in our mind and our mind is racing, the first thing we wanna do is sit down. I always ask people, sit down. You know, if we're walking, let's sit. Let's get ourselves in a comfortable seated position. We take a breath. We did this in the beginning of the webinar today. We observe our experience. What is it, notice, what it, notice what's happening? What's happening in the chest? What's happening in the belly? What automatic thought, negative thought is happening? So we, we're breaking that cycle of a thought and then a reaction, a thought and then a reaction. Pausing, observing, and then proceeding. I like to do the stop sign even when I'm not stressed. I do it as a transition. I mentioned that in the beginning to start a meeting or to start, you know, right before I, I begin my second part of my day when my kids um, are, you know, off from school. So this is really important to be able to um, take these pauses and reflect before you move on to the next thing. So that helps us break that pattern. Another mindfulness technique that I really like to, to have people try is something called two feet, one breath. And this is the idea of getting out of the head and literally feeling our feet on the ground. So inviting us, we can even do it right now, even seated, just first press into one foot and then the other foot. Press into both feet at the same time. Just feel the legs engage and then take a conscious breath. And notice how for that moment, we weren't thinking, right? It was a way to get out of the head and into the body. That pause just gives us this opportunity to reflect. All right, just a couple of more things I wanna share. So we can use the mind, and we'll, we can talk about this briefly, about we can use the mind to change the brain to benefit ourselves and other beings. When we're less stressed, when we're not caught in that reactivity, we have a wider window of tolerance to enjoy our lives. So paying attention mindfully in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, that's what that taking a breath is. John Kabat-Zinn who created mindfulness-based stress reduction, just taking that moment non-judgmentally to welcome what's happening in the mind and in the body. So we can practice mindfulness meditation, which is just paying attention to the breath or another object like the body five minutes up to an hour, we can develop this capacity more and more to get out of the mind and into the body. Each time we do that, we replenish and we nourish ourselves. 
So the more that we're present, the happier we are. There are lots of studies showing the act of paying attention in the present moment can combat some of the negativity of the, of the worried mind. This is a great study. A, wor a, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And it just reflects that the more we can pay attention, the happier we feel. We can do mindfulness practices throughout our day, informally, just by noticing what's happening right now. We can go outside this beautiful fall day and feel the leaves underneath our feet. That's an informal mindfulness practice. Or we can develop mindful breathing, a yoga practice, a body scan. And so during this webinar, I'm just giving you an overview, but there are many different resources to be able to develop a practice. So introduction to breathing, I'm just gonna really quickly review this, just a taste as we start to think about how we might use mindfulness. So as we're doing mindfulness of breathing, it's really simple. The instructions are really basic. We become aware of the sensations in the moment. And then when our mind goes back to one of those ants, red ants, black ants, we just come back. We just come back to the present moment. So I'd like us to do that now at the end of this presentation, just to take a few moments to do some breathing again. Feeling your feet on the floor, allowing yourself to Notice the breath, feeling the belly rise on the in-breath and fall on the out-breath. And if you notice thoughts that are coming and going, just notice them and come back to the breath. We're not trying to take away the thoughts, we're just anchoring our attention in the present moment. Let's just do that for five more breaths. And then we'll come back to this moment. So that was a very brief overview of easing the worried mind and beginning to create some resiliency. So my hope is that as we even feel maybe a little bit of the effects of the practice this afternoon, just there's a little bit more ease as we can break the patterns of the, the worried mind that are happening over and over again. So um, I'm gonna invite us to um, answer some questions now and turn it back to Susan. I'm so grateful that you practiced with me for this little bit of time. Tracy, thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation. I really want to encourage everybody to put their questions in the chat box. We aren't really able to um, manage the hand raise. Um, so if you could put your questions in the chat box, I would be delighted to relay them to Tracy and I'll give you just a few minutes to do that. Um, so, you know, Tracy, I just want to ask you to tell us a little bit about your upcoming program. So on November 2nd, the Mindfulness Tools for Lawyers. I know that's a whole series. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about it? Thank you. Yeah. So um, starting November 2nd for the month of November, four Mondays um, from noon to one, I'll be leading an hour uh, presentation on learning how to meditate, just like what I started to introduce today. So particularly the nuts and bolts, many of us have probably tried to meditate before. Maybe we use an app like Headspace, but to, to sustain a practice during busy times, it can be really difficult. So we're gonna spend the time really going through some practices, learning how to meditate, learning the benefit of that. Um, and so I'd love for you all to join us. And this is at LCL, they can register yeah. there. And it's yeah, so a series. Yes, it's a series, a free series through LCL, um, four weeks, and hopefully at the end you'll have a customized meditation practice for that will really help you. Terrific. And uh, we have some questions, so let's go to the questions and then sure. we'll come back. Okay. Um, can you recommend how to find a therapist who is a good fit? Ah, such a good question. That's hard. You know, that is a, it is a challenge. Um, you know, so some resources I often ask people to look through is like the Psychology Today website. You'll see in your area, first of all, who takes your insurance, but also their expertise. So if you're interested in, you know, my, I'm biased, my mind-body approach, you might look, and, and many of the psychologists and social workers will list what their expertise is. So if you have trauma and you're interested in going to a trauma therapist, 
So that's one way I like to start, at least to have a sense of, of does that person have a good match? And then honestly, it's like one or two sessions with that person. Um, it is okay to, to try to shop around a little bit and make sure there's a good personality fit. Um, you know, it, it really does take a little bit of effort, but I usually start with psychology today. Um, and then I ask them questions specifically, you know, how do they work with this? What modalities do they use? Uh, second question, do you have any tips for lawyers to con uh, control stress when the stress is caused by outside sources like clients, other attorneys, and deadlines? Yeah, so that's like the hardest part, right? That's that red automatic thought, that ant of like, you know, the external, we don't have control over. And so in those situations, right, it's recognizing the pieces that we can't control, right? We can't control what is happening out there, but we can control our inner reaction. And particularly to when to be kind to ourselves, part of our four week series, we're gonna talk about compassion. When we're struggling to be able to be kind to ourselves rather than to hurt ourselves. We often call that like the second arrow, you know, the first arrow when we're, when we're anxious or someone has caused us stress. The second arrow is what we do to ourselves. We beat ourselves up. So we can, we can address that part of how to bring self-compassion to ourselves so that we're not gripped with, with um, more, more punishment, more self-punishment when we're having a hard time. Mm, that makes so much sense. Um, so just remind us, the series is on what day of the week? So it's going to be on Mondays for the month of November, starting the day before election day. So we'll get into, we'll be doing some practice <laughs> to work with what might be coming up. So it's really a combination of practice and learning tools. Um, and so hopefully that will, that will be really supportive during this challenging month. Yeah. We have another question. What can you do to address and control stress when caring for an elderly or ill parent, child, and so forth while still practicing law? Yeah, so you know that that extra demand, right, of being home now and being in the sandwich generation of care, being a caretaker. One thing I like to do sometimes is to get people involved in my practice. My poor children now they're teenagers and adults, but I often recruit them to do a practice. Let's go for a walk together. Let's do some breathing together. Um, self care is great, but if there's not time to do self care for yourself, then trying to get the group to do it. So I try to do a practice, whether it's outside in nature or doing something mindful for myself. Also really creating a schedule where you even give yourself five to 10 minutes, you know, at the end of the day um, where you turn off the phone and literally do some breathing practice, laying down and placing your hand on your belly, hand on your heart and doing some slow breathing can be super effective. So I do both. I try to get the people I'm caring for to be to do something with me and then carving out even the smallest amount of time for myself that I stick to. Mm, that's such a good suggestion there. Um, so we have a question about registering for the webinar. Um, so this series, anybody can go on to our website, which is lclma.org. And you can register for Tracy's series. Just feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, if you run into any problems, feel free to email me and I'll help you get there. And I'll put my email in the chat box. Um, it's susan at masslomap.org. And uh, I can also put Tracy's in there too. That's Tracy um, at lclma.org. So, you know, certainly feel free to follow up with us with any questions that you might have. Um, Tracy, can you tell us just a little bit about the upcoming presentation that you're going to be doing on November 13th for the Boston Bar Association? Yeah, so keeping with thinking about November and the holiday stress coming up, um, we're going to be talking about holiday stress and particularly around some of the issues that some, some of the respondents just asked about, how to be home during this challenging time with family, um, the burdens and joys of, of holiday time. So we're gonna be talking about some mind-body techniques, a little bit of movement. Um, we didn't spend time today talking much about movement in the body and how that can also ease some of the stress going on. So we're gonna do a little bit of gentle stretching, a little bit of breath work um, so that you feel a little bit more refreshed going into the holiday season. And you can find more information about that on the Boston Bar Association's website. And I believe we also have that um, some information, I think, on our website as well on that one. Um, but again, you can always email either of us directly and we'll get you to the right spot. 
Um, so Tracy, thank you once again for a fantastic presentation. Uh, for those of you interested in listening again, um, we're going to provide a recording on our website along with a PDF of Tracy's slides. We'll get that up as soon as we can. And I want to um, remind you to mark your calendars for November 18th when Susan Blakely will present on what millennial lawyers want and how to effectively lead them. So that should be pretty interesting. So thank you again for tuning in today and have a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.